John leaves veganism, so you're going to leave veganism. That's very bizarre to me because that's just totally not what veganism is. Worry about it if myself or Dr. Ornish or Dr. Esselstyn or Dr. Furman leave it because we're the ones that are doing the research on this and, and the studying and the treating patients with it. Welcome to this episode of the Carb Strong Cast. Today we have Dr. Garth, da- Dr. Garth Davis, who is a medical doctor and author of the book Proteinaholic. Thanks for coming in, uh, Dr. Garth. Good to be here, Joe. Garth, could you please give everyone sort of a more in-depth outline of what you do? So I am a general surgeon by trade. Um, I started specializing in weight loss in 2001. And I also got board certified in medical management of weight loss. So now I do surgical medical management of weight loss and obesity. And I also um, do some studies on nutrition as well as being a general surgeon. Wow. So it seems like you're pretty well versed on a lot of the research and you spend a lot of your time going over a lot of the things that are written in the literature. Yeah. That's one thing I do a lot. Yeah. Um, To the chagrin of my family who is like, stop uh, reading all that stuff. Well, um, I just wanted to get straight into it. So I'm I'm an animal rights activist and I I don't focus too much in the health arena because we've got so many amazing doctors who are qualified in that area. But of course, you know, veganism is an ethical, ethical philosophy, like a moral principle. And why do you think people seem to conflate this ethical uh, philosophy with like plant-based health? It's it's a little bit weird to me. Um, I I try to explain this to people that veganism and whole food plant-based diets are really two different things. I mean, I've seen vegans who come into my office overweight. They're not eating a healthy diet at all. Like someone tells me they're vegan. I got no idea what they're eating. I know what they're not eating, but I don't know what they're actually eating. I mean, they could be eating a completely unhealthy, you know, standard American diet where they're eating, you know, chicken nuggets and fries and burgers and brownies. And so it's very different than a whole food plant-based diet. And, you know, the doctors that are discussing plant-based diets for health and are focused on the health side of stuff are not focusing on the vegan side because they don't like the vegan processed foods. Uh, To them, they're like, I don't want to talk about veganism because veganism is not necessarily healthy if you're eating a junk food diet. Um, likewise, I, I find it weird when people are like, um, oh, I can't be vegan because, you know, I have this nutrient deficiency or that, that, that that's all hand easily handled. If you're vegan, you're telling me you have an ethic. And I would expect that if it's an ethic, it's something that you feel very strongly about and that you'll there, therefore, you know, do anything you can to stand up to it. There I see so many people like, oh, I'm vegan. And then a few weeks later, nah, I'm no longer vegan anymore. You know, it's, that, that doesn't make sense from, a, you know, if it's a true ethical standard. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a kind of like, well, animals are being tortured and abused. And if you're against like animal abuse, it's like if you, I sort of make the analogy towards like, say, child abuse or some human rights violation. Like we don't go back on our principles on that. Like that's why I sort of hold the same similar standard to animals, you know, like I wouldn't go back on my principle against harming them. There's been a few influences like within the last couple of years and one recently who have sort of gone back on their ethics and their plant-based diet because of health concerns. So I just wanted to like talk to you because you're very qualified in this area. And should people be like worried about the efficacy of a well-planned uh, plant-based diet? Like if they shouldn't, why not? I mean, there's so much to say about this, right? Uh, I mean, first off, there's not that many people. There's a lot more people becoming vegan than there are people leaving veganism. It gets like this. I always hear these like carnivore websites and stuff saying, oh, all these people are leaving veganism. That's a, you know, they don't, they've got no data to support that. They're basing it on a couple of people. I mean, I know I could count on one hand the number of people that left a, a plant-based diet. These people, they're always young for whatever reason. You know, the, you know, the youth are more into the YouTube hits. And I don't, I don't give a damn how many followers I have. I really don't. I, I, people are like, I'm unfollowing you. All right, bye-bye. You know, it's not important to me. But I mean, a lot of these people, it's extremely important to them. It's part of their brand. They make money off of these things and um, it's their job. Uh, and, and so sometimes business opportunities change. And I think a lot of that influences. It's also not necessarily easy to be vegan. I mean, it's a, it's a somewhat tough ethic. I, I, it's a lot easier now than when I started it, when it was like, geez, gosh, impossible. Um, but now, you know, it's pretty easy, but still, you know, you could be somewhere and not be able to get something vegan. I also find a lot of these influencers are easily influenced. 
if that makes sense. Like, um, you know, they're, they're not, they're very into the influencing scene. So they follow other influencers and then someone, you know, another influencer says something they're like, Oh my God, did you hear what he said? Maybe he's right. Instead of this other person, they're not at all versed in science, you know? Right. And so their decisions are not based in scientifically. And so I, I think it's fairly easy for them to, you know, to, to be like, Oh, I heard something different. Oh, there may be a business opportunity. If I switch, maybe I've maxed out my vegan, uh, you know, fame and I could switch that over I could do it's like a country music singer crossing over to pop music maybe I could you know, pull in some more people uh and so I you know, like I see a lot of that the funny thing to me is the in, there's influencers that switch but then you look at the people that like the the, the whole food plant-based guys that really started the research on this none of them have switched I mean Colin Campbell is what 80 something years old uh Esselstyn who I see quite often looks fantastic I think he's 80 years old uh um, you know rich roll I mean there's there's so many of us that have been in this for a long time we're not switching we're not the guys we're not even close to switching we're we're the opposite we're we're like oh my god I can't believe I I went to my high school reunion I'm like oh my god you know people are like you know what are you doing that you, that you look so good and doing so well? And I'm like, well, I eat a plant-based diet. They're all, oh, never mind. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and so I don't know. It's so weird. And, the, and let me say one final thing. A lot of these influencers, like I know a couple, uh, one of them I talked to on the phone, obviously I'm not going to give details. They do like, they take it too far, right? They, they, they're like, I'm going to be vegan. I'm not going to just be vegan. I'm going to be no oil, no nut. Uh, I'm going to eat only fruit juices and I'm going to fast for 30 days and that type of vegan. And then yep. their health suffers and they're like, Oh my God, it's because I was vegan, which is, you know, it's silly. It's almost like people are searching for some optimal utopian um, magical lifestyle. And it's like they take right. the plant-based diet to the nth extreme and they're just right. not balanced and grounded and they don't, you know, have a vegan burger here and there, or, you know, do something outside of the, the confines of this raw f- raw juicing or something like that and you know i just i find it's those who are searching for this optimal thing they never reach it and then they keep over analyzing everything and then like fall off exactly yeah you know there's this kind of anti-westernization going on you know that's kind of like we need to be back to our paleo roots and things like that i want i want to go back to what we used to eat and i mean people got to understand that like all our fruits and vegetables have been hybridized. Our animals aren't, a cow is not paleo in any way, shape or form. Neither is a pig, neither is a chicken, neither quite honestly are your strawberries and your blueberries and your bananas. These are all been hybridized and it's, uh, it's, it's not the same as what cavemen people were eating. And so this anti kind of westernization has also led to an ant, like kind of, kind of a fear of ever taking any supplements whatsoever. But quite honestly, sometimes we need supplements in our diet and, uh, um, you know, most meat eaters are doing it. And I, you know, one thing I always hear people talking about nutritional deficiencies and stuff. One thing that kind of, I, in my practice, I, you know, test vitamin levels on everybody all the time, frequently in follow-up, et cetera. So I know the, I see with my own eyes, the actual vitamin deficiencies. And there's as many deficiencies in meat eaters as there is in plant eaters. In fact, there's more. If you look at the NHANES data uh, that was done in 2011, um, plant-based diet people, plant-based dieters tend to, or people that identify themselves as vegetarian, tend to, to get better calcium levels, better vitamin A, better vitamin C, better just about every vitamin except B12. Uh, and so, I mean, people are, are, are a little bit off, but they, they're so fearful of ever taking a supplement. And so they get into this weird kind of, um, I want to eat everything to be natural, but I can't, you know, it's, it, it, I can't possibly take a single supplement. Uh, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And then you, you actually take a look at their diet and they're having like vegan ice cream cheat days and they're taking protein powders and doing all of these other uh, energy drinks and coffee and all of these other processed unnatural quote unquote unnatural things. And then they go to go to eating grass fed beef, which is like a hybridized selectively bred Holstein cow or whatever. (laughs) Like, and it's like, in what way is that natural? And they're using a phone and it's just not logically consistent. And it makes no sense to like, completely throw exactly. out vegetables and a plant-based diet. But like you, yeah, exactly. you talked about nutrient deficiencies and like, let's talk about B12 specifically because a lot of the data, like you, like you say, like vegans might be lower in B12, but they might be higher in folate or folic acid or something like that. Like there's things that we're higher and lower in. 
Now, because uh, animal people might say this, they might say animal products are the only reliable source. There's no evidence to suggest we can get it from eating plants alone. Like, how would you respond to someone if they said uh, something like that? We can only get it from animal foods and we can't get it from plants. I would say fine, but I could get it from a supplement. Okay. I take once a week. I mean, here's the thing. B12 is, is bacteria. All right. It, it comes from bacteria. So um, meat obviously has it because meat's got a lot of bacteria in it. Um, plants, you know, typically don't. I do think, and I, I got to emphasize think here, so don't go off and do this and say Dr. Davis told me that this is going to work. Uh, but it is my belief that we didn't have B12 deficiencies thousands of years ago because we ate our food dirty. If you grow a garden with organic soil and you compost and you pull that carrot out of that garden and eat it right there, instead of washing and all that stuff, you will get adequate B12. We don't have a prospective randomized controlled trial on this, so I can't say that's definitely going to be the way, but it, it makes sense that way. I, I kind of experimented with doing that, but um, I was getting this organic produce and like, you know, there was just bugs all over it. I mean, every time I pulled it out, like the box would come delivered. I have to pull out the grubs and all that stuff. Uh, I'm quite certain if I would have kept eating it, my B12 would have been fine. Uh, but then I was like, this is, I'm just going to take a B12 supplement. Yeah. It's just that easy. And my B12 of, is great. Of course, because that's not really a practical solution for like a growing right. population either. And when you look yeah. at like, when they say, oh, cows get it from the grass and they eat the soil and the soil goes in their stomach and the they get the b12 yeah. but like a lot of the soils are depleted and they have they're injecting cows with b12 and they're putting supplements all throughout the animal's feed and then they go Absolutely. oh look the b12's in the animal products and it's like well you just bypass the animal and have the supplement yeah. is there any studies to show that b12 supplements actually work when someone's got a deficiency or as a doctor oh do yeah they definitely they definitely work they definitely get the b12 level up sometimes they may work too much there's some concern about like b12 causing acne and things like that if you're too high level mm -hmm. um but yeah they definitely do work um getting a little bit more complex but B12 deficiency, there's a whole pathway that could lead to this increase in homocysteine. So looking at homocysteine levels. Um, and there was like, if you look at the Epic database, the Epic database was interesting because um, they looked at people in Oxford, England that were vegan um, over many years. So this wasn't like a cross-sectional study where they just said, oh, he's vegan and you know, tomorrow he's not vegan, been vegan for many years. The, these people tended to be ethical vegans. So they weren't necessarily health conscious. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't eating a whole food plant-based diet. We know that because if you look at a lot of the things, like they're, they tended to have a fairly low calcium intake um, and they did not supplement B12 a lot. So there were B12 deficiencies in the group. And they also had a little bit of an elevated homocysteine level. Whenever you're looking at those nutritional deficiencies, you do have to look at the end point. So, okay, what are the end factors that we should see from a B12 deficiency? Well, we should see neurological disorders. Did they have more neurological disorders. No. We should see, because of this elevated homocysteine level, increased cardiovascular disease and heart disease. Did we see that? No. In fact, they had less cardiovascular disease than a low meat eating, weight matched group the, um, that they were compared to. So we could speculate about nutritional deficiencies all we want. The, the, the question is, is there an end stage disease from these deficiencies? And I have taken care of uh, fruitarians and, and strong vegans that weren't taking supplements that did have low B12, but had absolutely no symptomatology because of that low B12. So you got to keep that in mind too. I'm not saying don't supplement B12. I do. I'm just saying that we may be a little bit excessive in our warrior over. Yeah. And like, let's just say like you said about the study where some vegans were low in B12, like, you know, does that mean the, the diet, if well planned and supplemented, is inherently flawed? Like, because if you're taking like a bunch of ethical vegans, they identify as ethical vegans, they're obviously not, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't plan a diet to be nutritionally adequate. Because when are they, they should just grab all you plant based doctors and test all you guys, and I'm sure they'll get different results. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, we just haven't done that study. So, we, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, you know, it's we, even when I say they're ethically. It, it, that wasn't really a test question with them. It's just that their fiber levels were so low so, uh, that yeah. it was that it was figured that oh they can't possibly be eating a high plant based diet because you know if you're eating a high plant based diet you shouldn't have a twenty grams of fiber intake it should be much higher than that. Yeah, I probably had twenty grams of fiber for breakfast. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's about obviously it's about being responsible even as an ethical vegan. Look after yeah. yourself too. I mean, there's no point just 
ruining your entire health. But at the same time, don't take it too far to the point where you're just going to be eating raw lettuce and you know a bit of orange juice here and there. It's just crazy what people do. Uh, they're and I got to say they they um, a lot of them leave off starch a lot. That's another thing. It's like they're they're partly yeah. influenced by the plant based diet, but then they think carbs are bad, which just doesn't make any sense. So they avoid starches, which I think are one of our. I mean, McDougal was totally on about starches. Um, because the one thing I found when helping patients uh, go on diet is starch is my most valuable tool uh, to help them feel satiated and energetic. You're not going to be that energetic eating a salad. No. And and what happens when you get hungry, you go for the junk food because you're looking for that calorie rich food. But if I find if I'm having oats and I'm having big plates of brown rice, I'm less likely to want vegan ice cream at night or junk food. And exactly. So let's just talk about our children. So, like you, you for adults obviously you you know very well that a, a well planned whole foods plant based diet can be healthy should we, is it any different for children or should be we like let's just say there's an ethical vegan they have children who also don't want to harm animals and they also want to keep them healthy should they have any worries or should that just translate to the children as well or do they need to walk, watch anything in particular well there, look there's different stages we've got in utero which is important um, I do think omega, there's enough data now that omega-3 fatty acids are important for a pregnant mother for neural tube development of the child. And so, you know, mom should be getting omega-3s. Um, Meat-eating moms, fish-eating moms are still told to eat, uh, to take omega-3 supplements. I think plant-based women should take omega-3 supplements. I don't think they should eat fish because fish is very high in mercury. Um, and so I think omega-3 algae supplement is, is perfectly good. Um, in a growing kid, you know, kids could be finicky eaters and you got to watch out for that. Um, you, you always hear these like stupid things about these parents that were tried for, you know, uh, uh, child abuse because they put their patient, their, their, yeah. patient, their uh, kid on a, you know, and they're feeding their kid like these ridiculous, like a fruitarian diet where they don't give them anything else. It's just ridiculous. I mean, kids need things. They need zinc. They need vitamin D. They need iron. They need protein. They need calcium. These are all important parts. And I worry about it with my kids growing up, but I gave them these things and they ate it. If they weren't eating it, I'd be concerned, but they're eating it. Um, my kids eat beans and vegetables and fruits and, you know, um, you know, I'll go to dinner and my kids are like, uh, there was one time and I always talk about it in my talks and stuff, but I was at uh, lunch with my kids and a friend of mine and his kid and my kids are just downing crudite, downing it, hummus and crudite going crazy. And his kids eating a cheeseburger and fries. And he says to me, aren't you worried about your kids' nutrition? <laughs> it, like it's just like what look at my kids i mean look at what they're eating right there they've got beans they've got dark green vegetables they're gonna eat fruit i mean they're getting everything and they're my kids are 90 something percentile height and 50 percent weight uh wow. one of them is actually 40 percent weight on the lower end of weight which is perfect that's what you want most kids are you know obese like the obesity in kids is a lot so can you do it on a plant-based diet? Hell yeah, you can do it on a plant-based diet. I give them a kid's multivitamin um, to make sure that I'm not missing anything, but the, their diets are extraordinarily healthy and, and they lead a healthy life. My kids, I got to say, are not necessarily vegan. They're vegan in the house, but when they're not vegan, and we could get into why they're not vegan, I don't want to force them. I want them to choose it themselves because if I force them I'll be paying for psychiatric bills later on and yeah, they'll yeah. rebel against me and all that stuff. But when they're not vegan, that's not what's creating their health. When they're not vegan, they're eating ice cream and pizza, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so their health is because of their, their vegan part of their diet for sure. Yeah. Is there any resources for uh, parents to find like we're like yeah. let's just say they're a parent they're a bit concerned I, un, I i don't have a kid but i'm sure if i did i'd be especially concerned about them and i'd want to go somewhere where i can get like really good advice uh, like yeah. science-based advice where can they go so um i think pcrm physicians committee of responsible medicine has a uh, if you put in their children's nutrition and stuff they've got some stuff there um oh what is jackie's name there's a pediatrician who does a really good instagram um, plant-based pediatrician. But if you look up plant-based pediatricians on Google, I'm sure you'll find her and others. We've talked about specific nutrient deficiencies. Um, like obviously if 
if you're planning your diet well and getting a blood test from a doctor, you don't have to worry about them or? First of all, you should get a blood test by a doctor. I think it's always important to, to check what your nutrient levels are. Um, there, you know, people could vary. Like for instance, um, there are certain genetic factors. Do you methylate folate? And do you need methylfolate? I mean, these kind of things are important. It's rare problem, but probably good to know. Um, I do check levels on everybody. I check levels on myself constantly. And so I, I think it's important to check that. I think probably we could go through some of the nutrition deficiencies that vegans do get. Now, again, if you look at NHANES data, if you look at anti-inflammatory index, if you look at all these studies, plant-based eaters tend to be way healthier than meat eaters. When you look at life expectancy, when you look at heart disease, the number one problem we have in America right now is obesity. Obesity and diabetes are what we call diabetes. And you're just not going to find that in plant-based eaters. So again, plant-based eating is extremely healthy, but there are some nutrient deficiencies we need to look out for. Um, so you do need to look out for B12. We talked about that. Vitamin D. Now I see vitamin D in deficiencies in everybody because they're just not going outside. Um, the best source for vitamin D is to get outside and get sun, but that could be impossible at times and inadequate. Um, you do need exposure without sunscreen. So these are things that you have to keep in mind. Uh, 15 minutes daily is, is what we need on, uh, for exposure. Um, but get your vitamin D level checked. That's really important. It's actually important. We're starting to find out in this COVID epidemic and your ability to mount immune response. Vitamin D is kind of interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a vitamin, but it's also almost like a steroid hormone. Okay. And so it is important to get that. Uh, other things people worry about are iron. And if you look at long-term studies, and I really like looking at Adventist health because Adventist health, the vegans and vegetarians were um, more focused on health. It wasn't just ethics. In fact, I don't even know if it, how much of it is ethics. A lot of it was health. Um, and if you look at their numbers, they were a little bit low on iron, but they were not anemic, which is important because high iron is actually oxidizing and not good for you. So you do not want excess iron. Mm -hmm. If you're not anemic, the lower the iron is probably beneficial. Um, you could get iron in plant-based, I mean, bean, legumes, a huge, great source of iron. You could get, get them from nuts, seeds, molasses, uh, things like that. There can be zinc deficiencies. I don't, people overstate the zinc deficiencies. Again, if you're eating a pretty rounded plant-based diet, you're going to get zinc. Um, the, the other thing people seem to worry about a lot is calcium. Um, calcium is important. We do need to get calcium. I think when you look at bone disease, um, it's not just calcium, it's multiple other things. If you look at the Epic data study, the, the vegans did have a propensity to osteoporosis if they weren't getting 500 grams of calcium a day. If they were getting 500 grams of calcium a day, there was no worry about it. Now, one of the best sources is soy. People, that, that's another thing, going back to influencers and stuff. They, they get influenced that they shouldn't be taking soy. I don't, the, the meat industry or dairy industry has done a good job demonizing soy. And I don't yeah. understand it because soy is an unbelievably healthy. It's got everything, right? It's got calcium. It's got iron. It's got zinc. Uh, it, it's got everything you need. And so if you're getting some tofu, if you're getting dark green vegetables besides spinach, but dark green vegetables, uh, even sweet potatoes. I mean, there's all kinds of foods that have calcium in them, but you do need a varied plant-based source in order to get at least 500 milligrams of calcium a day. Um, that's the other thing people seem to worry about a lot. There are some studies showing uh, bone mar mineral density problems in plant-based eaters. But again, they tend to be plant-based eaters that aren't healthy plant-based eaters. They're, they're, they've got a low fiber intake. Yeah. Would you recommend it? Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say there's some other obscure vitamins that people are worried about, like K2. Um, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some evidence for benefits for K2. But again, if you look at vegans long term, you can get K2 from, from again, K2 is kind of like B12. Uh, it comes from bacteria. And so you can get it from like natto and, uh, and sauerkraut and things like that, which I, I eat a lot of fermented food. Uh, I, you can't really, I don't get my K2 level checked. That would be a specialized uh, level. K2 does help with bone mineral uh, density. Um, is it vital? There's no studies that show it's vital. Uh, the supplement, I take a multivitamin that um, I've got no affiliation with whatsoever. Um, I don't even know he knows that I take his vitamins, but Joel Furman has a vitamin and it's got K2 in it. Does that benefit me? I've got no idea. I just take my multivitamin daily. Don't worry about it. 
Um, but that's the other one that people seem to worry about. Then all of a sudden, I was at the USDA. So in America, we have this, the, the USDA kind of has a experts panel that comes up with a dietary recommendations. And I went there to testify about what they should be saying about diet. And it's amazing because you see the lobbyists there, right? Lobbyists, just hundreds of them. And they get up and they're, I mean, they are just saying absolute crap, right? They're just, meat is good for the heart. What? Like, what? Where do you get that? But the one thing I noticed them saying is they all kept getting up and they started talking about choline. Mm. Oh, eggs are high in choline, choline this, choline that. And then I started seeing this online effort to try to say that vegans are deficient in choline that affects our brain. This is absurd. We are not deficient in choline. Choline is not essential. You can create it yourself. Uh, there, you find it in a lot of um, foods anyway, in, in beans and white beans specifically, and chickpeas. And so you're not, no, we're, choline is not something that I'm worried about at all. Uh, in fact, quite honestly, I'm not really worried about much. I take my multivitamin and that's it. Yeah. And yeah. omega-3. To, to be, I, I take a, an omega-3 supplement and a multivitamin and that's it. Okay. Uh, would you recommend anyone to use like a chronometer app to start with to get an idea about what's in food or? It's, it's helpful. I think it's, it's, it's helpful to do that. I don't, um, I've kind of started getting away a bit from all this like chronometer apps. I, I did yeah. all of this stuff with patients where I had them um, mm -hmm. journal everything they ate and put everything in a computer. And I did all this analysis and it, it became so cumbersome and so difficult and like, eating became this like task for people. And I, I try to do everything that I recommend to my patients. I try to do it myself too. And it was just a pain. I, I kind of got to say, I like Gregor's um, little food app where you just make, and, I, and it's basically what I do. I, I want to make sure at the end of the day, I've had a couple servings of beans. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure I've had dark green vegetables. I've had berries. I've had a whole fruit. I've had some starch and some grains. And I try to do that every day. And that, that to me is a little bit easier. If I'm doing that, I know I'm getting enough. Yeah. So just being mindful of each, have I had my greens today? Have I had my fruit uh, today? And have I had some flax on my oatmeal and all of these things? Just keep it, just being mindful of these specific things and just uh, cover your back with the, like some B12 and vitamin D in the winter. And if you're not getting yeah. sun and you, you recommend a omega-3 supplement. What about say, let's just say, um, what, you don't just let me, think let me say about the omega-3 yeah yeah I, I cautiously recommend it the data is not that strong behind it um again if you go back to the epic data they weren't supplementing omega-3 they still had very good health i take it somewhat because when i look at the adventist health study in the longevity um studies and there was a great study done in 2013 on the adventist health study and um the pesco vegetarians seem to do as well as the vegans, if not a little bit better. And I think part of that may be that omega-3 supplementation. Um, we do need essential fatty acids. We do need, you know, we do need some fats in our diet. It helps absorb fat-soluble vitamins. I do eat nuts and seeds. Um, I think they're very healthy, um, uh, which a lot of, you know, the vegan people will not eat. Um, but there's certainly nutrient um, dense foods. And so I do eat nuts and seeds too. Yeah. I, I just go for the ground flax, um, on top of my mm -hmm. oatmeal just for the amigas. But, um, yeah, um, it's interesting that, uh, what you said about the fish, because like, it's like the fish has the amigas in it, but they, they get it from the algae and it also comes with all this other stuff inside the flesh of the fish. Like you were saying, mercury, and I think fish has saturated fat, of course, and all these other things. For a while, when I first started doing this, you know, I started off pure health. I mean, veganism came later. Um, but I started off pure health because I was very unhealthy. I was probably about 20 pounds heavier than I am mm. now. I, I went to get a life insurance policy test and just did horrible. I had hypertension. I had fatty liver. I had very high cholesterol. And that started me, you know, on this, on this quest to be like, I'm counseling people on their weight, but I'm overweight and I'm counseling them on their metabolic disease, but I have metabolic disease. And you know that my we have family history of diabetes and things like that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to tackle this. I'm going to try and see if I can come to you know what causes these problems. And, and at one time, I got very into Mediterranean diet. Was doing a lot of fish, but like I told you, I get my levels checked, and my mercury was sky high. It was 22, and I called up the company that did the test, and I was like, can someone tell me what a normal mercury level is? And they were like, um, well, I mean, technically it's zero. We should wow. have mercury. And I was like, oh damn okay uh so yeah so that was the end of my pescatarianism yeah not not a 
essential nutrient uh, mercury. No, no, <laughs> yeah. no, heavy metals, no. And also, like, just of course, like, let's not forget about the the, the fish. I've, fish feel pain and they suffer and we're destroying the oceans yeah. at the same time as well. So yeah, you go to, you, you get to the veganism it takes a whole different, I mean, at this point I wouldn't eat fish, even if it was healthy and didn't have mercury in it, because yeah. what I know about the fishing industry and the, did, did you, was it you or was it earthling Ed who had that video recently of them yeah, pulling Ed. in? Oh my God. I mean, everyone should see that because what, how could that, it's just, Come on, people. It's just not sustainable. No one thinks yeah. about that. That's the thing about being vegan. You know, you always hear these things about, oh, if you go get vegan, you're going to become depressed as if there's mm. something in being vegan that's going to make you depressed, which is obviously it's not true at all. But there is becoming an empath and becoming, you know, aware and awakened to what goes on in the world is a little bit depressing. Uh, uh, yeah, I get you know, it. When I look uh, around me at a restaurant, people are, you know, digging into their fish. And I think of where that comes from. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's almost like you become aware of certain things. And w with that awareness comes, you know, some well-being issues because no one wants to listen. And you're seeing the animal suffering and you try to talk to people about it. And they might ridicule you about it. And, you know, it's just a bit tough. It's always tough with me with my kids because I, I want to raise them right, but I don't want to force them. And, you know, you can imagine having me as a father. It might be a little bit difficult. Um, and I want them to be proud of their choices, which they are. Um, but one day my, my daughter said, Hey, all my friends go to Chick-fil-A. Do you guys have Chick-fil-A? Uh, no, but I know what it is. Chick-fil-A. Yeah, fast food chicken and people love it here. Yeah. Um, and so dad, all my friends go to Chick-fil-A. I want to go with them for Chick-fil-A. I want to have some chicken. And I'm like, all right, um, you can have the chicken, but before you have the chicken, I just want you to watch a video of where that chicken comes from. And I'm showing her the video and I'm, Part of me is thinking, because I see the tears in the eyes, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to cost me psychiatric bills, I'm sure. Uh, Dad showed me this video when I was young. But, I mean, gosh, he did not. You know, once you're aware, and kids are very, you know, they're, they have, they're not, their social infrastructure isn't so strong in their brain that they've got cognitive dissonance yet. You know, they're able to, to, to change their mind. And so she, she was able to look at that video and be like, oh, my God, I don't want to contribute to this in any way. And so, yeah, she, she – uh, who did not have the Chick-fil-A and doesn't want Chick-fil-A anymore. Yeah. And I think that's what I say when people say, Oh, you're forcing this on your children. It's like, well, wait a second. You haven't shown them the other side of the coin yet for them to make a choice. They should see where it comes from and they choose based on the information, not choose because you told them to eat meat or told them to be vegan or whatever. But there's always that thing. Like we teach our children to be nice to the cat, not to hit their brother and to, operate with this ethical framework and then we go oh here's a gas chambered stabbed in the throat pig have that and it's like sends them mixed messages you know what i mean it's like exactly it does that's a, i mean it's a, it's a good point because people don't you're forcing the kids but they've kind of forced their kids to eat meat they've programmed them to eat meat all their life and so yeah, yeah it, it's it is a little bit of a double standard there not a yeah, little def bit, definitely 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 and so let's just go back to the ex-vegan thing there was another thing that was said about um the fact that the fact that let's just say we've been hunters and gatherers, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years and people might argue that it's not safe to change such a long standing pattern of eating meat and, you know, scavenging for meat and all these things. So what are your thoughts on this? It's humorous. Like everybody who talks about our patterns of eating and what paleo man ate and, and writes all this stuff, none of them are anthropologists. All right. And the anthropologists actually, they find it very weird when they look at these diet, um, discussions that go on online and with pseudo experts talking about paleo diet. They think it's, there's a great book, a great book. The lady's not vegan in any way, shape or form. She's just an anthropologist and her book's called paleo fantasy. Uh, her name is Marlene Zuck. And she's just curious as to where people get these ridiculous ideas. They're, they're not studying the anthropological uh, data. They're just coming up with this, this idea. And I get this idea of this like strong, caveman like i ah, uh, and you know it appeals to these macho men like oh, i'm going to eat this and this is the natural diet of human kind but it assumes it makes some assumptions number one it assumes that all cavemen were eating nothing but meat and that of course is ridiculous so cavemen you know paleo man was eating all different diets depending on where they were number one number two from what we know from looking for instance at um carbon structures and in, in teeth of Australopithecus, or even they've had fossilized stool, believe it or not. They found fossilized stool, and then analyzing these things, 
I mean, Paleo Man was eating an extraordinarily high fiber diet. It was yeah. mainly bark and vegetables and gathered foods and things like that. We also had foods like a lot of times, like they won't eat beans because they say Paleo Man didn't eat beans, but we're now starting to find that there were legumes back then. Um, and and so their assumption on what men eat, like I hear this all the time, meat allowed us to get uh, make our brains bigger. And that, that's according to Nathaniel Dominey, one of the absolute world's experts on this. That's absolutely not true. He thinks that brain development came from uh, roots and tubers. Uh, so basically, like bulbs and tubers, that, that, that is what he said, you know, was the highest calorie density food that we could get and was the ability to get that high calorie density allowed us to develop our brains. And so basically bulbs and tubers are, you know, potatoes and, and onions, not the potatoes and onions we eat now, but, you know, the ancient uh, variety. Um, and so this idea of what paleo man was eating is completely wrong. They didn't have meat all the time actually very seldomly did they have meat. Most of their life was spent gathering. The other huge, huge mistake they make is this idea that our genetics are the same as paleo man, that, that we haven't had any evolution whatsoever. But in fact, that's categorically not true. We've had lots of evolutionary changes from the development of amylase in our saliva. We have adapted to our environment. We're still adapting. We're still changing. Um, and so this idea that we don't adapt and we haven't changed is completely wrong. I think the final the thing that's wrong is, is this idea that paleo man was necessarily healthy, that this is the example. In fact, we didn't start taking over the world uh, until the agricultural uh, boom, until we started actually doing agriculture and growing fruits and vegetables. Uh, that's when we really started getting enough calories to really uh, prosper. It wasn't meat. And yeah. um, the paleo man wasn't necessarily healthy. He died at an early age. We have no idea you know exactly how healthy he was, but it does, certainly wasn't as healthy as we are now. They paleo man was living to procreate and then dying. We're living to see our grandchildren graduate from high school and get married. Right? We want to live as long as we can and as vital as we can. I mean, I'm 50 right now. I would be ancient, you know, back in paleo <laughs> times, and they would be, you know, casting me off into the thing. But you know, I'm still living my best life. So. Uh, we've got different goals now than we yeah. did then. We want to maximize our health and, yeah. and and try to be as healthy as possible. So, I mean, the whole paleo argument to me is, I hate to say this because it demeans me, it's kind of childish and ignorant, quite honestly. Yeah. Uh, this uh, We got to eat like paleo man. This is, this is silly. We got to eat like paleo man, but use our cell phones and yeah. you know, <laughs> go to the sauna and do all these crazy things. You know? Yeah, I was just going to say, like we uh, would – we want to pick one thing like a paleo man does like a one thing a lion does. Right. Yeah. But we, we yeah. want to use hospitals and we want to use uh, modern medicine and we want to go to the dentist yeah. paleo people aren't doing all those things. So there are things we'll do for our health that aren't yeah. to do with diet, but are to do with technology and advancement, but not to do with diet for some reason. It's just yeah. crazy. It's, it's crazy. And then people do stuff with diet. That's crazy. You know, I'm going to go and get a colonic, a coffee enema. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just like it, they, they, these people and it's, I don't know, they call them biohackers, you know, these people that are so into like hacking their body to try every little thing to try to get healthy. Um, and yet, you know, they're going to eat meat because lions do. And that's the other thing. It's not just paleo, man. The, the, the attempt to try to make us look carnivores. It, look, these are not canines. We might call them canines. They're not canines. I mean, look at your dog and compare your canines. I just got bit by mine. And, uh, their canines are a lot different than our canines. Um, their our jaws go side to side. This is a you know the ability to yeah. grind. These are molars to grind up plant substance. We have amylase in our saliva to break down starch. We are we're hind gut fermenters, not foregut fermenters. We've got a much longer small intestine uh, and in colon. I mean everything about us, our microbiome and in, in our hind gut, it's all based upon a plant based diet. Quite honestly, we are we're. A, our closest genetic relative is a bonobos and you know, they're basically plant-based eaters. I mean, and in fact, in studies done in the Congo, when apes are given a preference of fruit versus other things, they're going to take the fruit. The only time they ever go for any kind of uh, animal um, consumption is when they're in a starvation situation. Yeah. So you would say we don't have any like specific biological adaptations to eating flesh. No, definitely not. Um, so we can if we cut it into nice little pieces and, you know, <laughs> cook it and put some nice spices on it and all that kind of stuff. But when you look at comparative anatomy, 
um, not to get too technical, but the, the best comparative anatomy is to look at intestinal absorption area versus body surface area. Um, that's the best way to kind of differentiate a carnivore from an herbivore from an omnivore. And when you look at our intestinal absorption area versus our body surface area, we are basically apes. We're basically right, right along the lines of apes. And so uh, looking at an ape diet is basically, if you want to look at a diet in the natural world that's most set up for us, you look at an ape. Though again, we're still different than apes. I think apes are basically more fruititarians. They're, and they, they eat a lot more than we do, right? They get huge. They, they, they're just eating all day long, which we're yeah. not. I, I would say we're probably more of a, a starch-based species. Uh, we're very well designed to eat starches from our glycogen stores in our muscles, the amylase in our saliva, um, our ability to eat starch and our ability to process starch seems to be a big differentiator for us. Yeah. And obviously the brain runs on glucose as well. Mm -hmm. And um, very well. Yeah. So I had another, I had another point that I wanted to make about that. Um, oh, also like if we adapted to eating meat over hundreds of thousands of years, how can we still develop heart disease in the main risk factor for heart disease is cholesterol, uh, raising a blood cholesterol and animal products always almost certainly have cholesterol in them. It's cholesterol, saturated fat. I mean, a lot of the, the, the true paleo guys are going to tell you, well, it's the meat we're eating and, yeah. um, and you know, the meat back then is different. And if we hunt the meat and they are right in parts, if you, if you eat game food, it's going to have a higher omega three level lower omega-6, lower saturated fat, lower cholesterol levels. And so uh, there is there is probably some truth to the fact that the meat they were eating back then is different. But they've looked at fossilized, you know, um, the Inuits that were frozen, and they did have evidence of cardiovascular disease. So you could find cardiovascular disease even thousands of years ago um, because, you know, they were eating you know, blubber and things like that. Yeah. I remember when they dug up those, were they mummies? And they, yeah. they said, yeah. And they had uh, atherosclerosis in the mummies. Yeah. They, did, they did CAT scans of them and they did have atherosclerosis. Yeah. And that's funny. The mummies, the mummy study was kind of interesting because they mummified the, the, um, the richer people, you know, the, the royalty and things like that. And so they were more likely to be getting animal proteins and animal fats in their diet. Whereas the, um, the peasants were eating a more, you know, plant-based diet. If you look at the Bedouin, um, they tended to basically survive on a grain-based diet. They still do. When you go out to, you know, if you go into Tunisia, Tunisia is interesting because Tunisia was had a very ancient diet for many years. And uh, in Tunisia, they had very low heart disease. And the Bedouin um, you know, eat a very high grain diet, very low heart disease. Then, of course, Tunisia um, finds oil. They become rich. They start eating a lot more meat. They start getting obesity and a huge increase in heart disease. But if you compare the the rich people in Tunisia from, that were benefiting from the oil and getting this westernized food to the Bedouin that were still eating their ancient diet and their traditional diet, they didn't have heart disease. So it was, Tunisia was a really good example of what happens when you start introducing meat to the diet. Interesting. Very, very good points. Now, um, I want to raise another point that I heard, um, how like, you might get like a plant-based advocate and a meat-based advocate read the same study and come to a different conclusion. Is that just because someone out of the two is wrong or one person can read the research better or the, is it, is it something inherently flawed in the study? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> Both. I mean, they're, they're, look, uh, we're, we're in this really weird phase of the world where we're almost like post-factual um, in this huge relativism. I kind of blame Trump for a lot of that. Like, he's kind of really created this, this, there's no facts, there's no truth. I could, I, I, I could tell you the, the sky is green and there's going to be truth to it. Um, you can read a study, like, okay, so there, <laughs> this was pretty interesting because recently a study came out, probably the best study ever done looking at a keto diet versus a vegan diet. It was done by the NIH by some really great researchers. They, anybody who tries to pull their, their bias is completely wrong. I know the researchers well. They're not the least bit vegan. One of them invited me out to a barbecue chicken place uh, for dinner one night, and I was like, I'm going to have to pass. Um, they are not vegan. Um, they took people I don't know who volunteers for these studies, but um, they got people to volunteer to stay in a hospital for one month 
and they did a randomized controlled trial with crossover. So what that means is they took these people and they put them on a vegan diet for two weeks and then flipped them to a keto diet or vice versa, keto diet, uh-huh. to vegan diet. And they looked at several different things. I mean, this study was so clear. What they really wanted to know is whether this, um, whether the insulin hypothesis holds true. So a lot of the low carb people think that the big evil in the world is insulin, which is ridiculous. We all have insulin in our blood. Meat actually stimulates insulin secretion, but they've been saying this for many years. And so they looked at the, when you're on the keto diet, you have a fairly low insulin level because you're not eating any carbs. So you're not stimulating uh, insulin on the plant-based diet. They had a high insulin. They're eating a high carb. It was a high carb plant-based diet and they're uh, only 10% fat. Um, so very high, um, carb and they did get a higher stimulation of insulin so did that mean that they gain more fat no in fact on the vegan diet they actually lost fat but on the on the keto diet they didn't lose any fat despite the slow insulin and this theory that insulin causes fat gain Um, other things happened they looked at like oral glucose tolerance test and the vegans actually had an improvement in their insulin resistance whereas the ketosis diet actually created insulin resistance so this was really to me a huge win for a plant-based diet and that when you go on the keto websites and things like that they're trying to spin this diet the the study any way they can trying to find any factor like oh but this but that and it's i mean it was comical to look at because i gotta tell you i if the study had gone the opposite i would have been like i was a little bit worried when they were doing the study i knew they were doing the study and i thought to myself i trust these researchers implicitly and i trust the research design so if it goes against what i've been saying i'm gonna have to acknowledge that it doesn't mean i'm not gonna be vegan anymore because again like we talked about before i'm vegan for reasons other than my health but i would have to at least tell my patients and and things if this went other ways these guys are so their cognitive dissonance uh they've got it under control because they they're trying to flip this any way they can and and going through this mental acrobatics to try to somehow show that it benefits them and so it, in essence they're just clearly wrong i mean the the, the head researcher is like i don't know these guys are crazy the, the, this is wrong the, the other thing they were looking at, because, you know, the keto people say that it controls satiety so well, but the vegan people actually in the study, the vegans did better with satiety. So any way you try to spin this is wrong, but they do spin it that way. And I've seen some of them actually report on this study to their audiences in social media saying this is a win for them. So, yeah, two people could read the study and get different answers, but one of them is wrong. All right. It's it just clearly wrong. Now, I think the other thing that you got to remember is there could be studies that differ with each other. And then you got to look at methodology. So you're in Australia, right? I'm, a, I'm in the UK at the moment, but I, I, I'm from Australia. Yeah. I'm from Australia. So then there was an Australian study called 40, I think the 45 and over study or something like that, 45 and up study. And it's about the only study that really showed this and one other study that showed it, it said that vegetarians have an unhealthy, uh, that are more likely to die early. Well, that's, different than just about every other study, right? That's different than the EPIC study and different than the Adventist Health study. And uh, so how is that possible? So you do have to look at study design, all right? In study design and the 45 and over study, they asked people at 45 some simple questionnaires, what do you eat? That's it. They never followed these people ever again. They don't know how long they were vegetarian. They don't know when they began vegetarian vegetarianism they don't know if they became vegetarian like me because my cholesterol was high and i had a family the history of uh, of this uh, they didn't do any controls you know usually in a in a study you want to do we could talk about that you want to do controls for factors they didn't do any of that yeah uh, they didn't do any of that then what they did is they just looked at death records many years later and they said oh there were more deaths in the vegetarian group but i know several people that were in that study that you know messaged me they were like oh my god that study's ridiculous i started that study as a meat eater and then went vegetarian but i'm counted as a win for the meat eaters Uh um you know so it was just a horribly designed study it's just it it, like you would design that study if you wanted to prove like there's ways to like so there's, there's ways to manipulate data and it's done quite often. I talk about this a bit in my book. It, there's ways to do bad studies. So for instance, the meat industry hates this idea of cholesterol causing high cholesterol. So they wanted the egg industry wanted to prove this wrong. So there's a couple ways of doing this. If you eat a lot of cholesterol, you saturate your cholesterol receptors. 
So if you then eat more cholesterol, you don't get that much of a rise in cholesterol. Okay, that's one thing. Number two, the, the, the number one factor that causes a rise in cholesterol is saturated fat. So they set up a prospective study, randomized, but in the control group, they ate more saturated fat. So they may have eaten, less, so in the experimental group, they ate more cholesterol, but less saturated fat. It was an easy little way of torquing it so that even though they were eating more cholesterol, they still wouldn't get a gain in cholesterol. So they don't put that in their, in their abstract, right? So you, like the average person who doesn't know how to look through appendices and things like that is going to read it and say, oh, look, they ate more cholesterol and their cholesterol actually dropped. Therefore, cholesterol drops. No, they didn't control for saturated fat. Likewise, there was that really huge study um, that was done quite a few years ago that started people saying saturated fat causes, doesn't cause heart disease. Yeah, I don't know if you remember when that came out. I was like, oh, saturated fat doesn't cause heart Bacon disease. is good. Was that, did they put something on the time, front of Time magazine? Was yes. that with the butter? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yep. So that all came from the study called the Siri Torino study. Everyone on that study received money from industry, every single person. <laughs> and they did a little trick in there that the, the average person wouldn't understand. So they did controls, which is good, right? If you're doing a study, a lot of people do univariate analysis. So univariate analysis is to say, like, for instance, in Hong Kong, they eat a lot of meat and they don't die early, therefore meat's good for you. Well, that's a univariate analysis. There's a whole bunch of other factors why people in Hong Kong live longer besides just that meat intake. And, um, and so that's missing out a whole bunch. So you've got to control. You've got to control for genetics. You've got to control for weight, all that stuff. So in the Siri Torino study, they did do controls, which is good science, except this is what they did. They controlled for cholesterol, all right? So what that means is that anybody with high cholesterol in that study is basically taken out of the statistical analysis. Well, that's a problem because saturated fat causes heart disease by raising cholesterol. So they took away the mechanism of the saturated fat causing heart disease, leaving just people that genetically were okay eating saturated fat and not getting high cholesterol uh, or, and, and not getting heart disease. And so it, it made it look like saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease, but it's because of the control. It's called over-adjustment bias but the average uh -huh. person wouldn't see that. So there's difficulties too, not just in how people interpret studies, but how people, you know, how the, the methodology of the study and how you can get bad results because of that. Yeah, so I guess there's someone who might not be as well versed with how to read papers and they might have a bias towards eating meat and then they just read an abstract of a poorly designed study and then they plaster all over the internet and people who never read research at all on a, who are on another level will just believe the influencer from that point because they've presented a study and that's where that's where like um in my response i said look if you're not a nutritional expert you're not even an expert on scientific data like leave that up to the experts or at least consult with an expert to see and, and present a study and say, well, here's, a, here's some conflicting data to plant-based diets. You're an expert. Can you please give me some, uh, some advice on how to read this and what they did here? Did they, is it poorly designed? Did they control for many factors? Like, what is it with this study? If you don't understand it, get some help from someone who does. Right. And a lot of people, you got to really get into who actually understands it too. I mean, there's people that are, you know, nutritionists, even dietitians. I, I know a lot of dietitians just don't understand the research literature and how to do um, research design. Um, it, it's, it's complex and you really need, you know, you need to be able to speak that language. You need to be able to look through appendices, look through graphs, be able to analyze, uh, do analysis. It doesn't mean that you have to have a PhD or anything like that. I don't have a PhD. Um, but you do need to have like, you know, uh, a facility with being able to evaluate a study for its proper methodology. Yeah. I see like st uh, statistical significance too. And they've got that little, uh, that arrow with the O point O and if it's like above O, then it's, you know, like, like that, that sort of stuff there matters. Like, yeah. I mean, uh, and you know, the funny thing to me is, um, like I see like on the, car the you know, there's this carnivore movement eating nothing but meat. Yeah. I mean, Okay, so they've got zero science behind that, right? Zero. There's no studies yeah. that say um, there's studies quite the opposite, but no, no study to support that. So they'll criticize epidemiology. Uh, whenever they criticize epidemiology, I could tell immediately they don't understand what epidemiology is. They think epidemiology is all univariate analysis, which is not the least bit true. Um, the other thing they'll do is 
they hate epidemiology unless they could find an article that supports their view. Then they love epidemiology. <laughs> Um, and they, they cherry pick, like I've never seen anybody cherry pick, like they will find anything they can. But then when you point out the fallacies in it, well, you're vegan, therefore, you know, you don't understand, uh, or you're biased. Um, look, by everyone's got biases. We're all born. There's no way there's a non-biased person out there. We all have biases. I mean, uh, I don't take any money from any industry, so I'm not financially biased. In fact, quite honestly, Financially, I probably work against myself trying to get people to, you know, lose weight without surgery because, you know, I make more money doing surgery than I do counseling people. Um, but there are people out there. You don't see them much on social media. But if I go to scientific meetings and things like that, there are people out there that aren't necessarily biased in that way they, they're able to look at two sides of an argument they're mm -hmm. able to i've got friends you know there's one guy online who's got a really big following dr spencer nadalski and we play with each other a lot and we joke a lot he's not vegan but he understands my side of it and i understand his side and uh, we we reach a pretty good understanding of you know uh, what it is and, and quite honestly vegan diet's definitely healthy there's no question. It may be the healthiest diet out there. Uh, there really isn't great studies one way or the other. It, you know, again, there's the other thing that I see people do is create the impossibility. Like, well, there's never been a randomized controlled trial. There never will be. We're not going to do a randomized controlled trial that lasts 20 years and tell us. We, we have to use some deduction, you know. Um, but a vegan diet is certainly healthy. It may not be the necessarily that you have to be vegan in order to be healthy. We're vegan again for different reasons. We're, you know, the reason Nadolsky's not vegan is because he doesn't have the same ethic I have about veganism. So he eats a healthy diet that's very high in plants and eats a lot of legumes. Uh, but I take it to the extreme simply because to me, I don't want to consume a product that was based in suffering is damaging to our environment is completely not necessary for my health. Um, and so people lose that in, in this discussion quite a bit. Yeah, I feel like they're focusing on the optimal health thing and excluding the suffering and violence that the animals go through. And the world is going to trash right now. It's just like if we keep trash. going in this trajectory, this trajectory right now is doomed. It's doomed. We're using all our resources and our land and we're filling up these slaughterhouses. And health is one thing. But then you've got the ethical principle and the environmental thing, which will destroy us all. So I feel like the, the ethics and environment should take precedent over some optimal health nonsense that you'll yeah. never achieve. And then this Absolutely. hunting, this hunting idea, this idea of like, oh, you know, like I'm going to go into the woods and hire out someone, pay a farmer to hire out their land and shoot some deer. Who the hell practically can do that? Are you going to feed the population like that? Like with a plant-based diet, we can feed the population and take care of all these other yeah. things. Like it's just nonsense. It is nonsense. And the other thing that's nonsense is the regenerative farming idea. Um, and so there are these farms that are regenerative and you can use animals in a farming situation that does... Uh, control CO2 and help. So there's a guy, Joel Salatin, he does this, um, uh, um, what's it called, agricultural rotation, where he brings the cows in to graze and then the chickens in and then, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and people are always like, well, if you just eat that way, uh, that will be healthy. Okay, fine. That That is regenerative farming. It, it does make environmental sense but it takes a lot of land to produce very few cows it, go and try and buy some of joel's meats they are exceedingly expensive this is in no way something that can be done for the rest of the world i mean leave out the the ethics of whether or not it's ethical to kill a cow that's lived a happy life you know you're still killing it but let's leave that that ethical argument if we're just doing environmental argument we can't Everybody can't have a regenerative farm and no one's going to be able to afford that. And it's not possibly going to be able to feed the entire world. It just can't possibly be done. So anytime there's an environmental argument, people say, well, meat eating can be environmentally good if you do regenerative farming. Yes, a regenerative farm is good for the environment, but not if you're going to tear down the whole world in order to feed the whole world at the current demand levels. It just can't possibly be done. I love when um, 
these uh, carnivore dieters or meat-based dieters point to the most best possible case scenario for meat, uh, but and then the worst possible base scenario uh, scenario for plants. So they'll point to like, um, you know, monocropping, and then they'll compare yeah. it to like Joel Salatin's beef. And it's like, well, wait yeah. a second. Let's get um, veganically farmed potatoes and tell me how much land and calories can get out of that, and how many crop deaths. Right. And then you can get vertical farming. You know, and yes. like all, all of these. Like, so if you're going to make an equivalency, not don't do some false equivalency because if you get yeah. worst case scenario beef and worst yeah. case scenario plants, plants win. And if you get best yeah. case scenario plants and best case scenario bin, uh, beef plants win you can you can um like uh have plant agriculture that doesn't harm any animals like basically yeah. like any animals but with with grass-fed cow uh you're uh, clearing all that land and you're killing the cow as well so exactly. yeah yeah they always say that right they're always like oh vegans you guys are <laughs> hypocritical because when you clear all that land you're killing rodents and things like that what they seem to miss is monocultural crops are there to feed animals. That's the whole purpose of having monocultural crops. So we can, the, the animals become a middleman. We're, do, we're putting huge resources so that we can feed huge resources so we can feed ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those monocultural crops, we wouldn't need them if we, if we were, you know, uh, no. not feeding the animals. Uh, that massive study that Joseph Poor from Oxford University put out, uh, I think it was 2018, and he said 82% of the farmland is used for, for livestock, and then you could reduce it by 75% if we all adopted a vegan diet. So I mean, we could recreate the world if we recreated demand. I mean, recreate the mm. world. We could reforest. We could um, vertical farms, hydroponics. You look at what they've done in Israel uh, in a desert. They've been able to have, you know, unbelievable hydroponics and vertical farming. Mm -hmm. uh, we could absolutely bring back nature and, uh, and, and do it. Uh, you could still have some regenerative farming, you know, but the, the, we got to change our demands. Uh, it, it's just the only way we're going to survive. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's continue on with it. I've got a few more things I wanted to discuss. And here, this is a really important one because uh, someone tried to discredit the position paper from the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics by saying, because they have corporate ties, um, this then makes the position paper invalid and they don't trust the organization. Therefore, that position statement, which has, I think, 117 sources uh, linked to it, is then invalid. What do you think about this? Who said that? Uh, John Venus said it in his video. That is absurd. That's <laughs> absurd. Um, they are heavily funded by meat, dairy, Nabisco. I actually went on an out, like a tirade against them when they when they came to um, Houston when I was in Houston because they had McDonald's giving the. Um, it was like a key sponsor and telling them that an egg McMuffin was safe. What plant-based person, in fact, I was quite impressed by the fact that they released that because it was the antithesis, really, of what they teach or what they're, what, if there's any interest, the interest is the opposite of a vegan diet in that organization. So I was kind of impressed. I thought it was impressive that they released that. I thought it was fairly honest of them to do so. Uh, and, you know, it's incredibly well-sourced, like you mentioned. I mean, it's, it's science. Uh, it's the position paper is really a review of science yeah. and the review of science is, is, is fairly blatant to say that that's really bizarre to say that an organization that's basically funded by companies that don't want you to be vegan, uh, is, is coming out with a paper saying that vegan is a good diet, that you gotta be pretty crazy. What about people might say that those who are in charge of doing that review or, um, sort of pushing that paper to the forefront where we're actually vegans and vegetarians. I think, I think a couple of them might've been vegan, vegan, vegetarian. What did you, what would you say about that? Does that then invalidate all of that review? No, like I said before, everybody's got biases. We got to stand like I'm biased towards a plant-based diet because I've done the research. I've seen the effects of it in treating patients. And so therefore I'm biased because, you know, because I know that it works. I mean, it's, it, because a dietitian believes in the research behind it doesn't make them invalid. It actually makes them more valid. They're, they're, they're walking the talk. Uh, no, I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of ridiculous. Uh, I kind of going through the biases. I think industry funded studies, you definitely got to watch out for, but you're never going to get rid of all bias. And you know, if you think there's a bias, then go and show me what it is. Go and show me which paper was wrong yeah. uh, and why it was wrong. What was their methodology that was wrong in doing it? 
you know, uh, just saying, oh, because they, they were vegetarian. To me, when I see a dietitian that's, how could there be a dietitian that's not vegetarian in my mind? I mean, you got, or at least predominantly plant-based. I mean, if you look at the science, it's so unbelievably clear. I would be shocked at the opposite, although I see the opposite on a daily basis. Yeah, it makes sense. It's almost like they're trying anything to discredit the individual or the organization instead of going into the paper, pulling up the sources and then debunking the sources that they've used to support the paper. They never, they never do that. They just go, oh, well, the whole, whole organization is corrupt. So you can't trust what they say about vegan diets, even though they're, try, they're constantly trying to push eggs and all these other things. And yeah. or, or the, it, that's such, yeah. a, such a bizarre, I've never heard anybody make that argument. That, that's a weird argument because when that paper came out, I was like, when that position statement came out, I was like shocked. I was like, wow, I did not expect that from this organization. Yeah. Well, it is the carnival crowd that are pulling out these conspiracy theories and they're polluting people's minds and they're, they're kind of gaslighting people. And, um, you know, they're it's just, so oh, bizarre. it's a conspiracy. Yeah. But you know, the weird thing is I, so I got in a debate with, um, with Lane Norton. Do you know who Lane Norton is? I've heard of him. Yeah, definitely. So Lane, Lane Norton's, he's got a PhD. He's a smart guy. He's a uh, power lifter, bodybuilder, um, and does a lot on nutrition. Pretty balanced guy, not ketosis, not carnivore. Makes fun of everybody. So makes fun of the ketosis guys and the carnivore guys, as well as he does vegans. And he went crazy over game changers. All right. Just absolutely crazy. He went crazy over game changers before Game Changers was even released, all right? So that's bias, right? If you're gonna criticize the movie before it's even released, that's ridiculous. But anyway, he wrote this long expose. And I was just gonna leave it be, but the expose was incredible because every single study that he put in that expose was funded by the beef industry. And in fact, the lab where he grew up is the most funded lab and in fact, his, his mentor that he loves so much has probably gotten more money than anybody from the National Cattlemen's Association. So I came up with, um, if you go to proteinaholic.com and you go okay. under blogs, um, my response to Lane Norton, I go into, huma I, I list article after article and I go into his, his source because he, he accuses the people in the, in the movie Game Changers of being biased um, None of them take money from plant-based sources. He's trying to somehow say that because James Cameron has investments in plant-based protein products, that therefore the whole thing is biased, which is stupid. James Cameron's got $700 million. He's investing in these products because he's worried about the environment. So that, in that expose, I go into plant-based, uh, into his funding for, for him to say bias is crazy because his funding for all of his research, all of it, is exceedingly industry funded, exceedingly. So there's a huge double standard. They say, well, vegans are vegan and therefore they're biased and then totally ignore the fact that their, their funding for their studies is all industry. None of our fundings are industry. The, the studies I cite don't have any, there's no big kale. You know, I'm not getting money from uh, the Apple Association or the Blueberry Association. It's just absolutely ridiculous. There's no plant-based funding. The only plant-based funding studies I've ever seen are olive oil and, and almonds, which a lot of vegans tell you not to eat. Um, there's no big kale industry. Uh, it's just a ridiculous thing to, to, to even state. It's only ever becomes biased when it's a pro plant-based study. It's never biased when it's a, you know, funded by yeah. the beef industry. It's crazy. And the funny thing is when I go, when I meet these scientists that write a lot of the studies that, that I cite, whether it's like, you know, I went to dinner with a bunch of the Harvard Scientists that uh, have done a lot of the health profession study and, you know, eat less meat, eat less dairy, eat more fruits and vegetables, healthy eating indexes, fruits, vegetables, all that stuff. I, you know, going out to eat with those guys, you're like, well, you're not following your rules. I mean, they're, they're not vegan. You know, mm -hmm. these guys that are doing these studies are not vegan. Uh, the NIH studies that are funded, especially the one by Kevin Hall, he's not the least bit vegan. Uh, these are not biased people doing the, the main studies that we've done. I, look, you could say Ornish is, is biased, but he's biased over years of success with it. You could say Esselstyn's biased, again, biased years of success with it, uh, of what he's doing, but you, you, they're, they're certainly not industry funded. Yeah. I mean, um, T. Colin Campbell, he was the one who was, he was 
originally trying to find a protein source to feed, uh, was it poor, poorer children? Yeah, yeah. He was looking at dairy. Dairy. The casein, uh, the casein set off. That's so right. He was looking at aflatoxin and the, okay. the fact that casein sets, sets off um, cancer. Yeah, no, I know. It's, 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 really, it's really strange when you look at it. Most of the plant-based doctors that I know are so dedicated to the cause. Not, do you know how much money I could make? If I, if I, if I, if I, so I write a book, Proteinaholic, about how we don't need that much protein. If I was to accept, I, I get messaged all the time all the time. Okay. Okay, will you try our protein product? Will you endorse? I can make so much money endorsing protein. I can make a ton of money if I went to the, if I went carnivore tomorrow and said, oh, I was wrong about veganism. I'm starting this YouTube. I, I make a ton of money. Uh, but, you know, I just would never do that. None of us would ever do that. I mean, the one thing from all the plant-based guys that I know, and we argue amongst ourselves too about little minor things, uh, is they're all very dedicated to what really is helping patients. I, uh, whether it's Furman or Campbell or Esselstyn or Ornish or Gregor, there is a fundamental caring on all their parts as to, and they're, I don't even know which of them. I'm like, I'm like the only, me and Barnard are like the only guys that really talk about the ethical side of stuff. Um, I don't know what their ethics are, the other guys. I mean, I, I, I get a sense that there's ethics behind their stuff too, but they stick strictly to the science of uh, plant-based mm -hmm. eating. But I'll tell you, their, their, their concern for people and the concern for the, the welfare of their patients is really extraordinary. Yeah. It's almost like um, when something comes up that goes against what they want to hear, what, what the general public want to hear they fight back at it so people want to hear these good things about the steak and the good things about the eggs and they don't want to hear the plant-based doctors going no 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 these are bad for you so of course you're going to get more pushback and then you're going to get more support when they say there's a big big vegan movement telling all these people not to eat these animal products and then someone comes out and goes no nah, it's actually healthy for you actually i'm not vegan anymore of course they're just going to get a bunch of support from people who don't want to change and like to be validated yeah, you know it's funny. I go to you know I do I go to Western medicine scientific meetings that deal with surgery of obesity and things like that. It, it's funny going to those surgery of obesity. You would tear your just go crazy, gouge your eyes out because you know it's been a week studying obesity and really no one's talking about food whatsoever, which is you know absurd. It's like what medicine and what surgery. But the funny thing is, you look around at the doctors. And then I go to a plant nutrition conference, 1,500 plant-based doctors, and you look at those doctors, and it's like a vibrant health, right? The, the interesting thing is everybody practices what they preach, and it's just a vibrant health. Like, vibrant, everyone looks, going for runs, and just looks extremely healthy, much different than when I go to an obesity conference, where mm. the doctors look overweight and just don't look nearly as healthy, and people are going out for steak dinners mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. It's just, it's, it, there's a tangible difference when I, when I interact with plant-based doctors. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. Um, so I think we've covered a lot of the research. Um, the most comp like, would you say there's any, like the most compelling data for you? Is there some, like some study that is the most compelling or would you say it's just more about the accumulation of all the data pointing into one direction? Yeah, you gotta look at data as an accumulation. You can't look at any one data point, right? You need to have a breadth of data. So for, you know, Let's take prostate cancer, okay? So in Japan, they have less prostate cancer than they do in America, but could that be, that's just a univariate analysis. So we could say, well, in Japan, they eat less dairy. In America, we eat more dairy. You can't say dairy causes prostate cancer. That's a univariate analysis. There could be a multiple different things. So you have to look at an epidemiology study that's prospective and that controls for different factors. So let's look at the Harvard Health Profession study. So now we look at a study where they followed physicians for many years and they found that the ones that ate more dairy had a much higher risk of prostate cancer. Still correlation, not causation, but they control for con confounding factors, right? They control for weight, they control for other independent carcinogens, et cetera. So now how do we evaluate that? Well, do we have a mechanism? How does dairy cause obesity? I mean, uh, prostate cancer. Well, we know that dairy, like we were just talking about with the casein studies with Dr. Um, Campbell, that they increase IGF-1. And IGF-1 is an independent risk factor for prostate cancer. We know people that could generally make high IGF-1, people 
uh, with acromegaly tend to have higher prostate cancer risks. So now we've got a mechanism, but now let's do a prospective randomized controlled trial to check our theory. So then there's a study done by Ornish where they took people with elevated PSA in early stage prostate, prostate cancer and half of them went on a plant-based diet and half didn't. And the ones that went on a plant-based diet dropped their PSA and they isolated their blood and found they had more natural killer cells to prostate cancer cells. So you can see there's multiple different studies in order to prove a point in that situation. Mm -hmm. And that's what it looks like in all of these different things. That's what I try to go through in my book is that you can't, there's not just one study. I can't stand it when people are like, go on PubMed and find one random study to support their view. You have to look at the breadth of science in order to create a hypothesis. In science, we don't accept any study until it's been replicated. Mm -hmm. And that's the interesting thing about the epidemiology. It's not one epidemiologic study showing the benefits of vegetarian diets or plant-based diets. It's multiple all around the world in multiple different places. Uh, and we know the mechanisms of action. We know the mechanisms of action for how meat causes heart disease or how meat causes cancer or how meat contributes to obesity. Um, and then you got to look at randomized controlled trials. If we take out meat, does this mechanism of action have an actual effect? Just like we were talking about before, does not having K2 have an actual effect on your bones long-term? Well, we don't really think that we'd see that. So does not having meat in a randomized control trial have an effect on obesity? Yes, it does. We know that in multiple different randomized control trials. Does it have an effect on heart disease? Yes, we know that taking meat out of a diet completely reverses, not completely, but actually could go to reversing heart disease. Uh, you know, so it takes multiple studies like this in order to, to really come up with a true scientific argument. Yeah, I think uh, everyone should listen to that and not, if they see one opposing study, maybe look into more or maybe like you talk, I uh, hear uh, doctors talk about the hierarchy of evidence too and the, the strength of the study as well, like a, you know, a, a systematic review would be stronger than a uh, cross-sectional study and Sometimes. Oh, cross-sectional studies are the worst. Uh, okay. there, there are some systematic reviews that have been done. There was, I don't know if you saw, there was this uh, the, um, American um, Journal of Internal Medicine ran a series of um, systemic reviews that were just horrible. It was funded by the meat industry. Okay. Uh, and they came up with conclusions different than the actual studies showed. So it goes back to that interpretation of studies. Um, and they used, they used, to evaluate a systemic uh, um, uh, analysis, you have to use certain protocols that they did. They were using protocols used to judge um, medications where you could do double blind placebo control. Basically, they came down to saying, because we weren't doing double blind placebo control studies on plant based diets, plant based diets don't work, which of course is stupid. We can't do a double blind placebo control trial. It's just, it's, it's unrealistic expectations. But yeah, there is a hierarchy of evidence, uh, the worst being anecdotal, which is exactly what you see out of the carnival movement, uh, is nothing but anecdotal. Oh, I ate meat and I feel better. Okay. Anecdotal evidence is becoming a religion in the, the carnival scene. I see that now. And even in the ex vegan, um, scene, they don't, they, they seem to think anecdotes mean some something scientific, which is crazy. So like yeah. with all of this out there, all these anecdotes, all these ex vegans, all of this, you know, pro meat and anti sort of plant based, you know, rhetoric out there, who should people be taking health advice from? Because as a new, let's just say you're a new vegan, you know, you, you're, you really care about animals and, you know, you've heard plant-based diets are healthy, but you're getting slammed. Like what's, what's your advice to new, new vegans getting uh, mixed messages and where they should get their information from? Such a tough one, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we have um, a problem in the world. now. I, I read this great, uh, this great, blog they were looking at you know george orwell had thought that the problem in the future was going to be that a few people would possess all the information and that the masses would be under control because they would have a lack of information aldous huxley who's one of my favorite writers had a different view he thought that the problem was going to be that there was going to be so much information out there that it was almost going to become irrelevant and how prescient that guy was because that's the problem, right? There's way too much information and not enough knowledge. There's a lot of plant-based doctors out there. I mean, it sounds stupid for me to say, well, listen to plant-based doctors because, uh, you know, listen to me. Uh, but there are a lot of good doctors out there that are that, uh, in the plant-based world. Uh, um, 
Uh, True Health Initiative is a group of not all plant-based doctors. I mean, one of the uh, isn't vegan at all, but kind of goes towards a, a more vegan diet. Um, there's doctors that have been studying this all their lives. It's like, you know, I did that video recently about, um, about John leaving veganism. And I said, God, I can't, why, why would people be worried? John leaves veganism. So you're going to leave veganism. That's very bizarre to me because that's just totally not what veganism is. Worry about it. If myself or Dr. Ornish or Dr. Esselstyn or Dr. Furman leave it because we're the ones that are doing the research on this and, and the studying and the treating patients with it. Look at those people for the nutritional advice. Look at the people that have been writing the books on it, that have been doing the research. Um, they're they're going to be a much better resource. I, looking at an influencer for nutrition, it's always weird to me when people go to an influencer for nutrition advice. So people, I didn't realize people were going to John for nutrition advice, I guess because he had muscles, which, you know, I get wary of anybody with muscles, to be, you know, a lot of muscles with a lot of lean weight. There's there's a lot of ways you could get muscles that aren't the the, the best way to do it, uh, and it also could be genetic. That's not having muscles should not be a resume for giving nutrition advice. All right, there's a lot of complexity with nutrition advice. When I sit down with a patient, I'm going to check their vitamin levels. He can't do that. Uh, I'm going to look at what they eat. I'm going to follow it regularly. They're going to come back with journals. You got, you got to look at people that are doing that kind of work, not people that just have big muscles and tell you to do what they do. Because a lot of times they're not telling you to do everything they do. And they're also maybe completely different than you. Maybe just completely different genetics, completely different age. I mean, I'm 50. I can't compare myself to a 25 year old. Uh, it's just a completely different situation. Yeah, I think it's pretty complicated and I, I'd, I'd agree with you there to stick to those people who are experts in their field or have been doing it for a long time and are actually practicing. There's a lot of practicing medical doctors who are uh, experts in uh, the plant-based science and nutrition arena as well. And they've got, you've got, you guys have all got your own resources, like your own websites and your own social media channels. And, you know, you present evidence with your claims always. I've never seen you guys make a claim without scientific evidence. And if you did, you say, I believe, or I think this, and you've even said that in this podcast here today, you've said, I yeah. believe that there's no evidence for this, but if you have evidence, you present it and you say that this is scientifically proven. Absolutely. I mean, I could, writing my book was painful. They want me to write another book now. And I'm like, it was painful because I didn't want to make a single statement that I couldn't stand a hundred percent behind. I, I wanted to make sure that like even the most simple statement, I wanted to make sure I had tons of evidence for. Uh, in fact, at one point they were just like, okay, stop. You know, you got to stop. We got too many references already. You got to stop. You got to tone it down. Uh, and so uh, people need to focus on people like that, that are, that are, that are really presenting the science. And I, I really, really would say people that are treating patients. It, it's, it's one thing to say things. It's another thing to actually treat people because when you treat people, you realize the complexity, uh, mm -hmm. the, the differences in different people. It's, it's a lot more complicated taking the science into the clinical setting. I agree we, with do have, we do have resources like the Plantrition Project is an excellent okay. project. It's a bunch of plant-based uh, medical doctors. Um, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, fantastic okay. group of doctors, not all plant-based, but very dedicated towards a plant-based diet. Well, where can everyone like find your book if they wanted to go and like read your book? Is it, you know, uh, does it, is it on audio book or can you just buy the mm -hmm. hard book? It's on audio. Uh, it's not my voice, but um, on audio, um, it's, you know, Amazon, uh, Barnes okay. & Nobles. A lot of bookstores are still still have it. I still see it sometimes hanging around, uh, though I published in 2016, so it's a getting a little long in the tooth for the bookstores, but you can still get it on Amazon.com and, and places like that. Well, thank you so much for coming um, onto the podcast, mate. I appreciate that you're so busy, but you've got a wealth of knowledge, and I think this – you really – um, helped a, maybe a lot of people who are new to veganism and or might be a little bit worried about John because they might have trusted him before and he's saying all these other things. And there's not just been John, there's been sort of a trend here happening with influencers doing this. So where can everyone find your work specifically if they wanted to go follow you? Dr. Garth Davis on Instagram okay. or Facebook. I, I, I will say be careful because I don't know, a lot of people steal my pictures and <laughs> 
uh, create these fake Dr. Garth Davis accounts. Um, a, a lot. When I say a lot, uh, there's thousands of fake ones. So mine are all verified. So make sure there's a blue check next to it from face from Facebook or Instagram so that you know it's really me. Okay. And no, I don't want to date you, and I don't want to. You know, I don't want to marry you, and please don't send me any money. I don't know how to do all these things. <laughs> I don't need your. I don't need your Apple gift card. Oh, the internet is so full of it, isn't it? It's crazy. Oh my God, it's crazy. Yeah, it's both good and bad. I mean, it's a great yeah. way to get information out, but a, a bad way to to get a lot of bad information out. Well, thanks again for coming on, mate. I appreciate no problem, your time. Bro. And no, I appreciate uh, yeah. what you do for the world. So thank you so much, man. Cheers, brother. Thanks a lot, mate. All right, take care. See you, bud.